Welcome back to Story Rant. I'm Eric Malachite, your resident cosmic horror, dark fantasy, and cyberpunk weirdo, and today I'm joined by Carl Smallwood of Fact Fiend. Now, to steal one of your things, in honor of you being here on the first ever episode of the Story Rant podcast, so... Far away, Carl. Today we're talking about the importance of physical media in society. And before we jump into the meat and potatoes of this thing, I just want you to go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and why physical media is important to you. And I'm going to go ahead and transition to interview. So you're in interview mode now. Yeah. Or interview. I thought you meant like transition to interview, like you know, some people would talk out loud. So I'm reminded of when I did stand-up comedy, there was a guy who would just say, Segway, every time he told a bad joke and just tell the next one. Oh, that, that's I thought you were just like, interview mode. <laughs> just, uh, uh, no, I have I'm, a close-up setting in OBS and then I have ah, it transition to the green screen and everything. But, I mean, no problem. it'll work. So yes, as you mentioned, my name is Carl Smallwood. No, the folks at home did not hear that incorrectly. It really is Carl and then small, and then wood, spelled exactly the way that it sounds. I've run a channel called Fact Fiend for the past five years and been working online for about 15 now. It's written like, you know, a couple thousand articles all across the interwebs, um, places people might recognize, Cracked, Looper, um, a couple for Dorkly back in the day, several for Top Tens. I've been the host for Biographics, Geographics, and Top Tens in the last few months, and have just been elsewhere online. But yes, I've created a lot of content in my time, most of it digitally, which is quite the opposite of what we're talking about today, which is physical media, but I'm a huge proponent and fan of physical media. One of the things I like to collect is just not necessarily obscure bits of physical media, but just ones that people look at and go, why do you own this? And I have a couple of examples of that like, in front of me and behind me on my YouTuber gaming shelf, which every a shelf that every YouTuber needs. You've got to have like a selection of physical media behind you to show people at home that I'm a person just like you. I collect things. I have a personality. Right. Can you uh, intro some of that stuff? Like show it off maybe? Uh, yeah. Well, well, I think it's it's not rare. It exists. It was sold. But I think just the story behind it. So the reason I collect a lot of physical media is for its value as a conversation piece. Not necessarily I'm not like an archivist or anything like that. But I have here. I'll show it to you there. This is a copy of... Wu-Tang Taste the Pain, which is the British or European version of a game you'd have over in America called Wu-Tang Shaolin Style. And this oh, is you a, were talking about this game. in a video I edited, actually. <laughs> yes, this is a PlayStation 1 era four-person brawler fighting game where you play as every member of the Wu-Tang Clan. And this is built upon the bones of another game, which does not exist, you cannot find anywhere, although you kind of can, called Thrill Kill, which is widely considered like the most played banned unreleased video game of all time which was a four person brawler fighting game where you played as serial killers and the game got shit canned can i swear in these yeah absolutely okay it, it got shit canned um, when it was about 99 percent done and it got it escaped onto the internet and became like one of these like legends on playgrounds i played it because it was just here's a because you could just download it onto a cd and play it on a playstation and it was built upon the bones of that game. So not only, I think it was the word they call it, provenance, is it? When something has a story behind it. So not only is this really interesting because it's a fighting game starring the Wu-Tang Clan, the story behind how a game featuring the Wu-Tang Clan came to be is also quite interesting. So I just like that I own this. So, so did you it have a, like conversations on the playground, so to speak, or like around with your friends when this game first came out? Yes, like when people thought, have you heard about Thrill Kill? It's like, no, I've never heard it. It's like, you play, it's a game. It's like Mortal Kombat where you murder people and you play serial killers and it's got boobs and violence in it. And then out of the ether of this like living playground rumor came Wu-Tang Shaolin style, where the developers just went to the Wu-Tang clan who love video games and all things nerdy. went, do you want to just slap your license on this? And they did. And just, yeah, the fact that I, and I now own that. And obviously you can't. This is never going to get re-released. You're not going to get a remaster right. of this on the PlayStation 5. There's going to be so locks. many like licensing issues with that. Just the music and stuff, and it's, it is locked to the PlayStation 1 ecosystem. You would never be able to play this game or even know that it exists unless you physically have your hands on a copy, which I do. Yeah. And yeah. that's the kind of thing that I love physical media for, because unfortunately a lot of things is just... They're trapped in 
like ecosystems or on bits of hardware that aren't popular or any longer supported. Yeah, and uh, I think this is an excellent segue into like the recent big news that big box stores like Best Buy, Target, and Walmart announced that they would be eliminating their physical media sections entirely, which would mean no more physical DVDs, Blu-rays, Nintendo, Xbox, or PlayStation games, possibly music, because I haven't seen a CD section since, I don't know, like 2018 or something in a Walmart. Yeah. I mean, PC has long since transitioned to digital formats, and you recently had uh, the CEO of, I think, Ubisoft come out and say people should just get used to the idea of not owning their games. But Yep, same is true of a lot of software as well. You have, like, Photoshop, um, all the Adobe suite is now on, like, I'm a, essentially a uh, subscription-only model. Obviously, I use the Creative Cloud for, for uh, Adobe Premiere, but that's it. Like, I don't like using Photoshop. I like After Effects just because of the animation stuff you can do. But I'm a big proponent. You can kind of see my um, <laughs> you kind of see my uh, XP pen tablet behind me because uh, I am a digital artist. I, I am an author. And um, I love Clip Studio Paint. But even they are starting to go to a subscription model with the Clip Studio Paint version 2. And I don't even know if I want to upgrade to that because those those services they nickel and dime you and a lot of the time like it's it's not worth it it's it's really it's a difficult thing to like uh, discuss as well because the most the solution that'd be ideal for all parties would be somewhere in the middle right kind of what we had before we transitioned to this you never own anything hellscape of if you'd like to have it digitally you can just download it and have it there but there'll be a physical copy available if you want it that was probably like it's the, as close to ideal a situation we've ever had, and we didn't even realize that we were in what might have been the best period of like ownership where you had the choice because it's in the uh, the best interest of the rights holders to not give us that choice because just not allowing us to own our content means that they can do whatever the hell they want with it. Yeah, and, and that's the future they'd want, but not necessarily the future that we'd want. And it's fascinating to think that we probably did have the absolute most ideal situation all things considered but just never realized it yeah oh, man Th to me this is a huge mistake getting rid of the physical media sections and for movies in particular um there's been a lot of talk by uh some of the movie reviewers that i follow on youtube such as one of my personal favorite people online chris stuckman and he's talked a lot about how DVD and Blu-ray sales, uh, when when the DVD and the Blu-ray comes out, they're really integral to the success of many movies, or at least they were yes. in the past. Like, it's a second um, opening, basically, for these films. And since... Yes, a lot of historical films did well from it. Like right. Some of the classics as well. Like one of my personal favorite films, The Thing, did gangbusters not in the cinema but on home video release right, because and that's how it became the cult classic that it is today right right it, it was panned critically when it first came out people hated the thing it's one of my favorite fucking movies of all time mm -hmm. it's a great fucking cosmic horror movie if you want to look at it that way um but movies like that and many different like more challenging pieces are not going to be made going forward in favor of you know the typical marvel schlock or, you know, your typical... Which I love. I, I love some of the Marvel movies, too. But, like, recently, they've gotten pretty lazy, I think. Mm -hmm. I think... But my issue with it is not... Obviously, that is an issue. Yeah, yeah. My primary concern is uh, the version. I, I'm a, a weirdo. It's like, I want the definitive version of something. You right. mentioned physical media. And even in releases of physical media, things can change. If not, the information contained therein, like the rejigging of scenes, what have you. Uh, an example I like to use is The Matrix, which has been graded differently multiple times on multiple physical releases. And to the point where different Blu-ray versions of that film are color graded differently. And if people don't know anything about The Matrix, the color grading is integral to the messaging put forward in the film. Mm -hmm. So it actually changes the messaging the film has, usually in an antithetical way to what the original creators intended. Because... And then that begs the question of, okay, which physical release is the definitive version of this piece of media? Oh, my God. So you just uh, opened a can of worms. You and I are both huge Dragon Ball fans. 
and mm-hmm. it's basically impossible to track down the uh, a, a good version of Dragon Ball Z or even yes. the original Dragon Ball with the accurate color uh, colors to when yes, it was this aired. Is, and this was going around the other day, wasn't it, in regards to Sailor Moon, where a lot of people remember Sailor Moon as having a pinkish sheen over every single scene, and that's not what it was intended to be aired like. That was a mistake in the transfer process. Mm-hmm. And it just never got corrected, and people were using that bad version of the media that's got copied and changed, and and now it's now that's what people think of Sailor Moon. It's like no, that's not what the intention was when it was aired. Yeah, it's like uh, artifacts in a JPEG. Well, like just saving something over and over again, and like and not only, the imperfections become more pronounced till they eventually become part so integrated with the thing they can no longer be separated from it. It's really disappointing because this is also Toei Animation, and Toei Animation is notorious for this shit. Uh, Funimation is bad, <laughs> and now they're just Crunchyroll, right? Um, yes. So Funimation's Same. pretty much all of their Dragon Ball releases are tainted some way, in some way, except for the extremely rare Dragon Box, and even that is still not like up to par. Um, it, there are still problems with it. And in any case, it's not HD, you know, it's DVD quality. So it's not, it's going to, you're going to get that weird stuff. Like I've got the Blu-ray for Avatar The Last Airbender. I got it for my wife for Christmas uh, because we noticed our our DVD collections because we both came into the marriage with our copies of Avatar The Last Airbender because that's what you do. (laughs) <laughs> of course, yeah. Well, you don't want two copies, unless you, me, and I have like five copies of the same thing. In I, some cases, I get attached to my media, so I'm like, I don't want to trade mine away, and she doesn't want to trade hers away. So when we moved into the new house, we were like, well, we got to get rid of one of these. Uh, and I was just like, I noticed that there was a lot of weird scan lines and stuff, and weird animation quirks from uh, watching those shows. On a uh, uh, on a DVD on an HD TV, it's mm-hmm. it, like you need re-releases where they update the films, uh, the film quality and stuff, because a lot of this stuff was done on film. Uh, but especially with Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball's colors uh, on the original cells are starting to fade because of the way it was made. Yep. Um, just knowing that off if the top don't. of my head, it's it's really frustrating. Yeah. And if that's the thing, if they don't put an effort into maintaining that, it will disappear. Like Lost Media is a very popular topic online. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on them, the idea that those imperfections that you mentioned are part of the charm. Because I'm not sure if you've ever seen the breakdown of, um, for example, VHS. When people think of VHS like scan lines and old TVs, like that's part of the charm of a lot of that media. And you may have seen those images of when they re-release like old games from the era of standard definition in 4.3. Like at sprites, for example, mm-hmm. people always remember them looking better. And there's multiple breakdowns out there. Like, it's not your memory playing tricks on you. They did look better because they were designed with the limitations of the hardware they'd be showcased on in mind. So sprites look better on an old standard def- definition television, which was the dots instead of the lines. And yeah. the sprites looked smoother as a result. Um, similarly, I'm thinking of like another fil- favorite film of mine is Terminator 2. When James Cameron was making that, he was keenly aware that. Because it would not only be shown in theatres, in like whatever, the, I forget theatre aspect ratio, but it would also be shown on DVD, which is, and maybe not DVD at the time, but like he knew it would be shown on maybe. Um, terrestri- terrestrial TV in 4.3. So when he was framing Terminator, he made sure that um, he had like a, a bar around his camera lens, or his, like, you know, his preview that showed what 4.3 would be, to ensure that all relevant information was kept within the 4.3 squares for when it eventually went to VHS. That's that's amazing. I never knew that. But the idea of like you know the limitations of the hardware did impact stuff. So, and obviously I own the Super HD remaster of Terminator Two. But I was wondering what you thought. That's just what you do. (laughs) Yeah, there's a certain charm though to the stuff from further back because those limitations or those mistakes or those like those imperceptible things that you wouldn't have noticed at the time are part of what lent to its charm. Like. Listening to a vinyl, like the, the stuttering of a vinyl, what have you, or the, like the, you know, the crackle, skipping of, not skipping and... of a seat. Yeah, yeah. So, do you have any thoughts on that? Of like, it's uh, you want, which is, and I acknowledge that that's like quite a paradoxical thing to want. Of like, uh, I want it in the highest quality possible, but also I want to be able to view it through the lens of people who had at the time. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a lot of thoughts on this, actually. So I, I love analog horror because I grew up yes. with VHSs and I love the feeling that analog horror, good analog horror gives you when mm -hmm. you're sort of alone in the middle of nowhere and you all you have is this CRT TV and, you know, mm -hmm. the fucking uh, emergency broadcast uh, uh the tones going off in your tiny wooden house like that that is a very tangible thing but i also you know i have fond memories of all the vhs's that i grew up with because i am old and um mm -hmm. i do see a value to the way vhs's and those old tvs presented is uh, the media especially with uh special effects the way they were done mm -hmm. back then especially when cgi was first coming out you know, uh, Jurassic Park, for example, holds up incredibly well, even at high definition. But there are still yeah. some effects that are a little dodgy at the at like Blu-ray quality levels. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll you'll with anything you will notice the uh, you will notice the imperfections uh, around the time when The Dark Knight came out uh, and the Blu-ray for The Dark Knight came out. People are talking about yes. how, you know, Blu-ray is like, do we really need to have like 4K or this really high definition uh, quality, you know, isn't uh, like, isn't it a bit like watching a stage play sometimes with some movies, you know? And I think yeah. there is an argument for that. Uh, um, when the Batman came out recently, I really appreciated how Matt Reeves uh, was not afraid to dirty the frame up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it is there the cultural experience, especially with VHS and with uh, all of these different media presentation formats, definitely has value. And the sad thing is, you know, with VHS, obviously it's it, every time you watch it, the quality gets worse. Yeah. <clears throat> but that yeah. is part of the charm. Yeah, and that's the thing if you allow me to be like arty farty and philosophical, I really like that. I like the idea that eventually it can disappear. It's like, um, there's a, it's a, it's a silly example, but it's the one that springs to mind immediately. It's the, the image someone shared of like, my wife loves this Garfield plushie. Uh -huh. And like, she's hugged it so much that it's like eyes have worn away. So it looks like the eyes are closed. Huh. And it's like that. And it's like, you know, it's something that's been enjoyed so much that it no longer resembles the original, but it's like the hands, like, you know, it's got that, that tactile thing of like people have, it's been handled. Right. Now, I wonder if it's the same way that like, when you look at like a piece of art on a wall and you can see like, you know, the brush marks of the artist who touched it initially. And it's yeah. those mistakes and those imperfections that add to it. But with something like mass produced, you, you don't get that as much, but I've always liked that idea of like, um, uh, it's like when you buy a secondhand book and it's got someone's name written in it from like 20, right. 30 years ago. There's, there's like a memory tied to it already when you Yeah, there's, there's the a cover. story to it. It's like I was saying, like with my copy of like Wu-Tang Taste the Pain. I don't own it because I have any particular affinity for the game. It's the story attached to it. And right. There does become a point where media goes beyond, like just the ownership of the thing mm -hmm. can have more value than if it works. Like even if this game didn't work, I would still own it. It's like I don't, ha I have the ability to play it, but I've got plenty of friends who they have old games from their childhood they enjoyed or old films and DVDs. I've got like VHSs behind me from my childhood that I dug out of my my, uh, my dad's house before he moved and threw everything away that I have no ability to play but I still have an attachment to I've got a few things like that myself um, I have a <laughs> history of Trunks VHS with uh, Dream Theater on it <laughs> so um, I was a big prog metal fan in uh, high school and middle school and whatnot mm -hmm. so I was that one kid that liked prog and um yeah, it's just I'll never trade that just because it was such a formative experience showing that to my friends, you know, when it first hit store shelves at the Suncoast video store in the mall, you know. But more than that, like, it, uh, you bring up games, and one of my favorite games of all time, probably my favorite game of all time, I've, pl I've probably yes. played it like a thousand times, is Mega Man X. And mm -hmm. on, on the Super Nintendo... And I still own a copy of the cartridge. I had to trade it at one point because, you know. Yeah, I've got I got an example of that here. Yeah, Just, yeah. We, I thought you mentioned video games. So I've got an example. A cartridge. This is what video games used to come on. 
Actually, I love the idea of having the props, so I'm going to go grab my copy of Mega Man X. You're going to go grab your... <laughs> <laughs> I just grabbed a couple of mine. One sec. I do not own a copy of um, uh, Mega Man X, unfortunately. That's okay. I'll, I'll shoot B-roll later. <laughs> okay. But the, the, one that, the one that I brought, um, I just thought it's a dual point as well. Not only is this a piece of physical media... Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is is when there is only one version of something, the digitally available version that is provided mm -hmm. by the source, that can be changed. It means that, like, you know, the various changes or inconsistencies or, in some cases, regional differences get lost and you only have access to this one homogenized version. That might not be the version people are familiar with. So the example I have I can show you here is a copy of Star Wing for the um, SNES. Over in America, that's Star, Star Fox. Fox. I owned it. So and that's the thing, but and that's the thing we've dealt with when I've been doing videos. We'll mention the titles of films, and me being here in the UK, sometimes the titles of films are different. I mentioned that Wu Tang Taste the Pain. It's Wu Tang Shaolin style over in America. Mm. And, and uh, Batman Beyond, which you got a lot of shit for. It's Batman of the Future over in the UK, or even like you know just silly B movies. One is the Rundown in the United States is Welcome to the Jungle over here. And when there's only one version available, those differences are not only not acknowledged, but can become forgotten. And I think the best example of that would be Star Wars, mm -hmm. where the highest quality version available of all those first three Star Wars movies is the version on Disney+. Plus. And they're making changes to those. Like they change the Han um, and Greedo scene again. Yeah, and there's... On uh... the digital version, that's the only version of it you can now access. Like the the highest quality version is on Disney and they can change it to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, in fact, fans had to take the uh, uh, restoration project into their own hands to restore the original yes. versions of those films and it's the best way to watch them. And I've actually as well, I've written an a article on this where there is a genuine argument of nobody having seen Star Wars, because right. George Lucas was such a weirdo, he was changing stuff while it was in cinemas. Mm -hmm. For example, he was changing like the sound mix when it was still in th the opening title crop. So people going to see Star Wars in the theater in the first month of release, people on opposite ends of the country would have, not overtly different, but still different experience of what the film is. And then you ask the question, which again sounds a bit like, you know, arty farty, but... Who saw Star Wars? Did they both see Star Wars? What, what right. was the original intent? Was it the, was it the version that was first released? Was it the version that George Lucas changed? At which point does the changes start to materially affect it to the point where you can no longer describe it as the version of Star Wars that they saw? And it becomes like a almost ship of Theseus problem. Right. Like how much can you change from the original and it still be the original thing? Some would argue nothing. Some would argue as long as the spirit of the thing is kept intact, that's still fine. But... Yeah, yeah, the fact that the there US, is a genuine argument the that US no one Congress has us. <laughs> wanted Star Wars to be preserved. Yep. You know. And they wanted the original version. They mm -hmm. wanted the original. And George refused. Real. Yep. And yeah. now no one knows where that is. There comes there comes a point, especially with people like George Lucas, and I understand being a perfectionist, but like there are things in my first couple of novels that maybe you know, might not be the best quality for as far as like my writing goes. Um, I'm not going to go back and just change those things uh, just mm -hmm. because I've changed or I've improved as a writer because, you know, it's, yeah. it's part of who I was at the time. It's part of the yes. process. It's part of the art. And the argument would be there of like, how important to culture are those original early stories? And it's like, okay, hopefully one day you will be a very... Like, they will be saying, the early lost works of um, right. Eric Malick's <laughs> But for George Lucas, the argument there is, Star Wars is part of culture. As long as culture exists, people will know about Star Wars. And that's why the Library of Congress exists, isn't it? Like, we mm -hmm. want the highest possible quality version of this thing to remain, hopefully in perpetuity, so an example of it will last much longer than the life of the original artist. Yeah. And the idea that just George Lucas is like, no. It's almost something you've got to respect. Almost. Then the idea almost. That, like, I can, yeah. I can see it being a good thing in some ways. Like, if you want to create a new version of this thing, like, we didn't have the technology back then to do this thing, mm -hmm. but continue to have the original as it was experienced yep. by people 
available. Like the, uh, there's yeah, not the point I made though. What is the original version? They didn't delete the original was theatrical different... cut of Alien when the director's cut mm-hmm. came out. Same thing with Aliens. There's a director's yeah. cut which I've watched more than the original apparently because yeah. I was offended on my rewatch for a video essay I've been Where working on. Where is Ripley's daughter? Where is the morning scene? I need that. Yeah. Why did you? And uh, yeah, because that's the fascinating thing for me with Star Wars because it's such a unique example almost of he was changing it when it was in theaters. Right. Not by much, but he was changing it. It was like just a, if you go to Wikipedia and Google like list of Star Wars changes, it was being changed while it was in theaters. There were different like sound mixers that he was mm-hmm. tweaking. He was tweaking the score. He was tweaking lines of dialogue. He was tweaking the speed of the opening crawl. He was tweaking special effects. He was cutting scenes and reorganizing scenes and redubbing over dialogue while it was in theaters. So what is the original version? We don't know. Yeah. It's I, fascinating I would to think about. I would love to have been alive like, at the time to, to watch it. Yeah. Just to see. I mean, that's the people who were alive who watched it probably can't ever see the version they saw as a kid ever again. Yeah. Because it does not exist anymore. And that's the fascinating thing for me about physical media. So I love that it exists, but the convenience of digital media also cannot be understated. Like the convenience, like I'm playing, like when I always play Baldur's Gate 3 and I wanted to play it right then and there, I could just hit download and be playing it in 20 minutes. Like that's great. It is great. But that that's also, like, back to Mega Man X. Like, I have yes. fond memories of basically whoring that cartridge out to all of my friends. Mm-hmm. Like, and this was in the early 2000s, so PlayStation was already a thing. PS2 was coming out. Yep. But for some reason, during the PlayStation era, I was too poor to afford one. So I had this Super Nintendo and, like, a crappy PC with Windows 95 on it that I could maybe play Diablo on. And yep. that game, like, left such an impression on me. It blew my fucking mind, and yeah, I it shared a, it. It has a story attached. Yeah. It does. It does. And, like, all of my friends who even had PlayStations or PS2s got to experience that with me because I shared it with them. Like, no, you need to play this. This is this is different from what you're used to playing. Like, there, there is something there. And people would, like, beg me to borrow the cartridge. And we would, like... Mm-hmm. Uh, with Mega Man 7, the same thing happened. I you know, I let a friend borrow Mega Man X, and I borrowed Mega Man 7. I held on to Mega Man 7 for weeks, and people were like, why are you playing this old game? I'm like, it's awesome. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, it's uh, and that's something you don't particularly get with um, media as it exists now. And I no. remember seeing, a, there was a way it was summed up that I saw, and it is... Uh, a lot of people growing up today, it's the embarrassment of riches in regards to content. Right. Of, there's just so much out there and so much of it is good. Like people can joke and talk about how like, you know, there's a lot of bad media, but I think it's called like the Disneyfication of media where even the worst Disney movie is still pretty good, good. to great because it's always going to be shot well. Yeah. Like, it's going to have good sound mixing. You're going to have actors in it who are competent. It's going to be competently edited and written. You don't really get the six, five out of ten films anymore. And I'm guessing, like myself, you there's a lot of those six, five out of ten pieces of media that defined your personality. Yeah. Because it's all you had access to. You didn't have the ability to hop onto your TV and have every piece of media from the past 25 years locked in immediately ready to stream at an instant. You had four DVDs on whatever was on TV at the time. Yeah. That's something I feel is lost with like the lack of physical media. Like, oh, this shelf behind me. Like, there's stuff on here that is not great. Like, the Animaniacs game for the SNES. Like, I have here. I remember Mario. <laughs> the three-hour biggest ever video for the Super Mario oh, Bros. show, which had, like, the that. live-action bits in the middle. That wasn't great. But I own it, and it formed a part of my personality. It's all I had. It's yeah. all I could watch with my brother. I didn't have the ability to press a button and stream 55 episodes of, like, Hey Arnold or every episode of The Simpsons in a row. Right. And, and while there is definitely value to being able to see a show in its entirety, you know... Absolutely. Uh, there, there's also, like... Okay, so one of my first, besides, like, the obvious seeing bits and pieces of Blade Runner and uh, Alien mm-hmm. and stuff. Oh, my cat's about to eat. <laughs> so uh, she's going to be chomping away, so I'm going to have to repeat all of that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Just keep it in. 
Yeah. Keep the cat light. All right. All right. Professionally unprofessional. Uh, it's also as well, it's, it's the mistakes that people will like. Right. Right. <laughs> it's the mistakes are always what people remember. I think she was like, nice. I, I don't know if you heard her meowing and uh, like pawing for me uh, earlier <laughs> for my attention. So that might be in the, the finished video as well. Oh, it's fine. But but it's those uh, mistakes that add to the quality, that adds to the charm. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, when I was first getting into anime, uh, I traded yes. pretty much all of my Pokemon cards for a bunch of anime VHSs. That this guy, he was in high school. He was way older than us uh, in the trailer park I grew up in, and uh, well, part of I spent like a few years there. Uh, long story. You don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. But this guy was like, he was so cool. He was like punk, you know, he, uh, he smoked watched cigarettes, anime. he watched anime, you know, he was like, he uh, basically kind of had a British accent, you know? Um, so he was like the bad boy in the park. I've got mature mm -hmm. anime. No one else has. Uh, he had a copy of uh, Ninja Scroll uh, and Armitage the Third. I saw our the like the Poly Matrix movie on Sci-Fi, and Armitage the Third is not good cyberpunk. Let me tell you, it is a flawed piece of media, even the OVA series. But it blew my fucking mind because I had never seen anything quite exactly. like it. Nothing yeah. that challenged you as far as like, yeah, this lady, this uh, why is a Mars cop dressed in basically a two-piece bathing suit? Obviously, there are problems with that. And, you know, as a horny preteen, that appeals to you somewhat uh, in a very big way. Um, but there were other questions that were asked, like, what does it mean to be human? Can, mm -hmm. You know, um, inner uh, inner politics or cross uh, planetary politics between Mars and Earth. It, there were some deeper questions being asked there. Not all of them answered very well. But it well, was still, still a, a good intro for me as a as a kid who should not have been watching that movie because it's like rated R. <laughs> um, I think as well, but yeah, there's there's a value to that, and I think yeah, something I discussed with some friends privately uh, a while ago, and this this topic came up is not only is it good that we've got like the six or five out of ten that you know just it's obscure. It's that as well when you see something that's okay but not great. Yeah, you think I could probably do that. Yeah. But like when all your access is, is like, you know, just really well polished stuff and it's like, you know, it's the stuff that's been polished to a mirror sheet. It's like it's like going and listening to like an eighties playlist and all you hear is the top one hundred songs from that decade. It doesn't give you like a real overview of what the music yeah. was like then. You're just listening to a like, you know, refined list that people twenty five years later have decided was the best. Right. Um so one thing that it I do... It you of an experience almost. It's not a true reflection of what culture was at the time. Yeah. Um, so I had... Mostly, so... which I'm saying is mostly it was shit. Yeah. And it's the shit stuff that's the good stuff because they're the people who cared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a huge, I'm a huge lover of bad media. I am a wholehearted supporter of everyone needs to watch bad media, consume bad media, even if it is just to give you an example of how not to do something. It just gives you a more rounded perspective on like what media is. Like, you know, not everything's yeah. like, you know, a Disney movie. Not every like not every an all animation can look great. Not all special effects are fantastic. Some of it's terrible. I, I definitely enjoy being able to look back and watch terrible horror movies. <laughs> yeah, and the problem Cause, is because you're of those right. terrible horror movies. Yeah. But the terrible stuff doesn't get remembered, and as a result, it's probably not going to be on digital streaming services because uh, no one cares. Shudder would like to know your location, Carl. <laughs> I, I do know about Shudder, yes. Well, what, you know the point I'm trying to make, though, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the terrible stuff, that's like the stuff that has, like, uh, there's a charm to that, and that's not the kind of stuff that gets remembered because it's not profitable to do so, and I think that's the, the thing there. It's, like, it's not profitable to like store to like to pay to store and maintain this, so we're not going to bother. And it's like, no, well, that's the stuff that that that's the stuff that inspires people. Yeah, yeah, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that. So, um, one of the other things that I think we're really missing out on is when I was in high school and I was re-experiencing a lot of these. Yes, baby kitty. I heard that. I heard the cat then. Yes. Yeah, she's. Uh, begging for attention is uh i would walk about a mile 
in the Southern California heat uh, and in the valley, for those of you who don't know, it gets really humid. Not as humid as like on the East Coast where I live now, but it's still uncomfortable, <laughs> especially as like a teenager and you're wanting to get back to the air conditioned environment as soon as possible. Uh, but yes. I would walk in uncomfortable, seething heat for a mile back and forth to the Hollywood video to grab DVDs of Alien, Aliens, even Alien 3 and Resurrection and like everything, mm -hmm. ev every Arnold movie that I could possibly get my hands on. Uh, my brother at the time, we would go out and search for obscure Arnold movies. This was like a pastime of ours to go to different Hollywood videos, different blockbusters, different video stores, yeah. anywhere we could where there was a weird uh, Arnold movie. And I know that you have uh, you have thoughts on, on The Sixth Day, and that is how we saw The Sixth Day. We didn't know that it even existed, and we wouldn't yes. have without Hollywood video existing. And now, you know, kids today are not going to grow up with that. And I noticed, like, even the stuff with, like, what I was talking about with uh, Super Nintendo games and sharing them and the sort of the cultural e effect of that, the communal experience of couch co-op and or playing single player games back and forth to experience together is not really a thing um like my nephew he doesn't really have opinions like this he's 16 and doesn't really have opinions on movies you know he likes transformers just so movies. Much of it, yeah. yeah he's just like i like uh, so i like much content to consume it's either i like it or meh I liked it. Yeah, we saw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, 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 Mutant Mayhem because I'm a huge Ninja Turtles fan. So, of course, I had to see it. I had to take my nephew to it because uh, he's a big TMNT fan, too. And I asked him what he thought about it. And he was just like, I like it. It was good. You know, there's not like a, an, a, a, a deep conversation to be had there right now. Which and, you don't expect from a younger person, but it's it's telling that you can almost pinpoint the moment where kids didn't have to watch the same video over and over and over again. Right. Like my sister, for example, like she's probably just on the cusp of that. Like she's 19 years old. So when she was growing up, like, you know, we had like, you could call it cable, we call it digital TV. So there's quite a few channels, but still have had DVDs. And she was just obsessed with a TV show called like, lion hotel or something like that and we have just we got the entire box set that she'd watch over and over again of just this weird pseudo reality tv show about lions and to this day she's obsessed with lions and tigers and animals like that yeah she wanted attention she wanted to be yeah on camera um you're gonna put the cat on camera yeah. but i just think yeah you could, there's d does that happen i guess it must do though so uh, it does a friend of mine has a son who says he's just like bluey, but mm -hmm. because it's not just that he watches blue all the time, it's, it's, I guess it can, can still happen, but okay. you're not forced into making that choice. It sounds weird to say, like, you know, limiting people's access to something is going to make anything better. So I, I, I love that people have access to such a vast array of things. I feel there is a. It's, it's not a thing I'd, ever, I'd never want to go back to the way of media of it costing so much money and be so prohibitively expensive, like, not people not having access to it, but I feel like it's um, uh, an embarrassment of riches, like I said earlier. There's yeah. so much that you get choice paralysis of. There's too much and choice. The, and the natural inclination is just to watch, quote unquote, best stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's like, you mentioned like video games, they like the SNES, they released like, you know, the SNES Classic, which has like 30 games on it. There was like 500 games on that console, which no one is ever going to see. And it's like, what I mentioned with music earlier, but it's just going to keep getting refined to just a best of list. And yeah, that might be the best stuff from that period, but it might not be the best stuff to everybody. And it might not be right. to everybody's tastes. Right. Um, I'm a big fan of Rush, but, you know, they released some garbage in their time. Um, like, and I had like a curated introduction to Rush, which it was a good introduction, but it was all... Uh, something that another person thought was their best stuff. And I found a lot of yeah. charming stuff uh, in their discography. And, you know, there's there's value to listen. I'm a big fan of listening to an entire album and getting an opinion on it 
before you move on from it. Sometimes I'll Which keep... you had to do. Yeah. Right? Back in the day, you had to. You had no choice. You had to listen. You, pay, you paid money. And again, I would not want to force people into that situation of having, to, of having no choice but to listen to this album they paid money for. But there is something to be said about the experience of that, of yeah. how much it can help shape someone's personality and interest during their, their formative years. Yeah, absolutely. And like... Obviously, I, I'm connected to a lot of indie authors. I'm connected to some New York Times bestsellers, too. But the indie people seem to have this this feeling that they have to churn out as much stuff as possible to stay relevant. And, like, I tried that for a little while. It's it's not sustainable. You know, you cannot, <laughs> at least, you cannot release 20 books in a year and expect all of them to be, you know, good mm-hmm. and stand the test of time. So... Like, I think we're definitely losing some amount of allowing the artistic and creative process to run its course, especially with, you know, AI and stuff being the clusterfuck that it is right now and making so many artists and writers panic at the moment. Like, the quality will speak for itself. Yes, people will read shit. Um... And some people won't care, but there is, you know, there is a value to the craft and preserving the craft and how your creative process works. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I just, I really enjoy having physical books too. Um, we're getting a little off topic, but like I, whenever uh, a buddy of mine releases a book, I'm like, I would like to have the physical version of it and obviously i live in a smaller house now so i can't do that as much so i have to eventually get an e-reader but i don't want to i like the as you can see behind me the uh audience can't really see it because they're see seeing both of our faces uh spliced together on screen uh i have the entire dragon ball manga and um what i get into arguments with people a lot uh who have not read the manga have read or have um, only watched Dragon Ball Super or GT or mm-hmm. something like that, or on anime only, and I'm like, you're missing out because there is there is a magic to Akira Toriyama's paneling, his artwork, his yes. pacing, and everything. It's a, a literally different medium, so you it get is. a different perspective on something you love. But, but yeah, it's a it's a literally it gives you a different perspective on something that you enjoy, and I I don't understand why people wouldn't want to do that i can understand it's like okay i have no interest in this 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 genre this topic this particular thing but if you do enjoy it you sh- like just surely you'd want a new perspective on that allows you to experience it from someone else's point of view or just you know get a fresh set of eyes and like you know just have a physical link to it because that physical tactile link it's it, it can't be you know there is a value to that. You can see behind me, I have like, you know, original artwork painted by friends. That is entirely unique. No one else has that. Yeah. Like that artwork that's behind me. It's like I see, I, I love that kind of sh- shit. And you don't get that with the digital version unless you own like PT, unless you got like that demo on a PS4 lock somewhere. Right. That's like the only tech case I can think of of a piece of digital media being like almost to a level of um, lost media. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a digital artist primarily. Like, I, I love digital art, but but you know, if I'm gonna like, I painted uh, a Cthulhu piece for my nephew yes. for Christmas, and uh, got it done up in a nice print and everything. But there is there is something that is not quite as cool as like having the original of this thing because he yes. doesn't have the original file. Where is he going to put it? Where is he going to store it? You know, is he going to put it on a little yeah. disc or something? I mean, that's an idea, but it's not the same thing. And like, I could almost see the argument for like the the NFTs and whatnot, where the idea of something being the only legit what? version, even though NFTs are bullshit and yes. uh, they were a huge Ponzi scheme. Um, yeah, it's like I said earlier, it's like there's a there's a the answer will be somewhere in the middle. I don't want a world where, say, if you want to see a piece of art, you have to physically own it. I don't want a world where if you want to play a video game, you have to go out and track down a copy of it and right. play it on the physical hardware. I'd like people to have the option to just, you know, have it on a computer. But I still it's... have my Super Nintendo, and I do, yep. do not have a CRT television, so I'm not booting that thing up 
you know, because yeah, it's... And that's, that's the thing. It's, yeah, there is a, the perfect solution will be a combination of both. And unfortunately, right. we've got like the shit end of both sticks in our hands. And it's like, okay, I guess this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. So that's uh, the, I, I, I don't want to be entirely on where everything has to be physical. It's like, it's impractical. It is. It is Absolutely. impractical. But also at the same time, it's like it's frustrating as a fan of certain bits of media that, you know, the version of it that the only version of it people can access, if they can access it at all, is in a lot of cases a bad version or it's the version that the original rights holders or the people who've got the rights to it want you to see. Like, so like Star Wars, like you have to see the version that with all the crappy changes that have been made. Yeah, the bad CGI, you know, ugh. You know, that's the only Big Daddy Disney wants you to see it, so you better open your mouth and uh, you better like it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the thing. I think there is a, the solution will be somewhere in the middle. So it's it's difficult to. Dec- oh, yeah. So it's frustrating. Uh, it is, but it's frustrating because there's no answer. So I don't I don't know if you have a store like this where you are in Sheffield, but um, yes, where I am in Richmond, we've got a couple of stores. They're used bookstores called Second and Charles. And they have a massive physical media, uh, used physical media section. And that has become, there's even some like old uh, uh, blockbuster uh, rental DVDs and Blu-rays there. We we have something similar. And it didn't start life as that, but it's kind of become that just by the nature of its existence. And it's sex, or CEX, Computer Exchange, but... We just call it the sex shop because it's funny, and <laughs> that's just a place. It's like you know, just it's like a pawn shop, but it's a bit yeah. classier than a pawn shop where it's like you don't go in and you see someone's like busted ass TV or something like that. It's like, and because it's generally staffed by, I just want to say younger people around my age who they kind of know, like right. they almost every CEX store that I've ever been to, and I always go into them when I walk past them, will have like a retro section. Like, for example, they'll have, like, boxed copies of Symphony of the Night for, like, the PlayStation 1 in there. That's, like, selling for, like, 400 quid. Because they yeah. know. And yeah. They'll have st- and they'll have, like, old, like, SNES consoles that have been refurbished and things like that. It's, like, it's not dedicated to that, but they understand there's a market for it, so we'll always carve out a small section of the store for that. Second and Charles is the same way with the uh, used games and stuff, too. He has a huge yeah. manga section. He was used uh, huge... <laughs> Use science fiction, horror, and fantasy, and uh, historical fiction, massive sections for that, uh, just fiction in general, nonfiction. You can find so much stuff there. I found a bunch of classic cyberpunk books and cosmic horror books that I was looking for. Uh, it's just the same thing you see. Sometimes you'll find the classics, but yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's, but it's run by people who know. That's why like, you'll go in and it's like, oh, a copy of Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes for the GameCube. Oh, it's £75. You're yeah. not gonna, it's not like you're going to go to a car boot sale and find it for two quid. The people running that store know how much that's worth. Right. So it's nice to see something like that, and it still exists. But you, then you look and go, why does this cost 70 quid? It's like, oh, cause it's like, there's probably like 400 copies available for sale in the UK because everyone who owns a copy is not selling it, and the people who are willing to sell it know what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the silver lining being that if you want as a younger person to experience these types of experiences, like with the stores that no longer exist, the rental places like Blockbuster and um, like Hollywood video and all of those types of things. And the video stores that have gone extinct too. Um, second and Charles and sex, apparently uh, CX. There are stores like the sex shop that exist. And you can have a similar experience. It's not the same thing, you know. You don't have late fees and stuff like that. That's kind of nice, you know. And for for like two or three bucks, you can get a DVD or a Blu-ray of this thing when you know no other store is catering to that need. And um, there's value to that. So seek those there out. Is. Absolutely, and it's. Um, I think it's. Partly the pandemic did this because a lot of people just had not like you know not everybody but a lot of people ended up with like just I'm not going out I'm not going to the bars once a week I've got all this like you know and I'm stuck in my house I would like to have things in my house that I want to look at it started like you know this huge like collector mentality in a lot of people like yeah. Pokemon cards and stuff and physical media and all that became huge during the pandemic because people were just well. I want to collect things that make me happy and not depressed. So I will collect things from my childhood. 
Absolutely. And I think when kept in check, that's a good thing, and we should do that. Absolutely. That's the thing. It's, it's completely um, impossible to... It's, it's not any sort of reason to expect there to be a huge light with everything that has ever existed, because that's a lot of stuff. And, you know, a lot of stuff that is pretty bad. And I guess that's like... Yeah lost media and there's a lot of stuff that's lost media it's like a lot of it was probably pretty bad but there's no real excuse for it in the modern age of like you know a digital a digital shelf has there's no limit to the amount of stuff that you can put on a digital shelf so that, that's it frustrates me in that sense but yeah absolutely i agree with you wholeheartedly on that and we should probably wrap this up you know yes Ended up going a lot longer than we ended up th- thinking originally. So, Chris, it's but an it, interesting it's, topic, and it's it, for, for the first episode. I think this was a fantastic conversation to have with you. And um, yeah, bottom line is, it's sad that these the experience of shopping for physical media with your friends, with your family, and stores and things like that is it's going away. You know, you're not yeah, going to have the excitement of going to the store just to look around and finding that rare thing on the shelf that you didn't know you wanted or needed. Yeah, and it's, it makes us sound like... <laughs> I'm pretty sure... I forget. Is it THX, whatever the hell it is, that early George Lucas film, where like they literally have a scene in it where people buy coloured cubes just for the love of owning a coloured cube and then immediately throw it away? <laughs> We're talking a bit like that right now. Like, a little bit. <laughs> you buy it for the love of owning it. It's like there is something to be said about a thing you can hold in your hands. And like the still like no one has people do, they have nostalgia for things they watched as a child, but just to be able to have like, you know, a physical reminder of that, like, you know, in the space in which you live. So I'd say it's like the difference between like, you know, having a screensaver on your phone of like, you know, a loved one and actually having like a physical photograph of them on a desk. Yeah. So they're fundamentally the same thing, but one, at least to me, has more inherent value because I can can pick it up in my hands. You know, there's effort there. It exists within the physical space in which I live. And if, you know, my house burned out, that would be lost. It's unique. Even though it is a copy of something else, it's unique to me because, as I was saying earlier, there's provenance to it. There's a story. If I physically had to go and get that printed out, that's a photograph that exists. I pick that frame. It exists only in my bedroom. I chose to put it there. Yeah. Nobody else has this. And maybe that's like a weird mentality to have. I don't know. That's how I approach a lot of the physical media that I own. And when I and the stuff that I own is not unique by any sense of the word, but I think it's unique in the fact that I own it and my reasonings for owning it are. Yeah, no, I would I would say that that is kind of, you know, that is a profound thought. That is, that it has value. And it's I'm glad... It's artifacty as well. <laughs> I sound so it, it is a little, when it, I talk about this. Not going to lie, it is a little arty, uh, arty farty, but there's nothing wrong with that. And there there's no. value in stuff like that. It's, it, the problem is when people take it too far. You know, yeah. where, you know, nothing else has value because I have this, you know, original Monet. Yeah, that, you know, that that's the of. thing is I, I I will acknowledge, you know, all that stuff I just said it, it having value, but I will also acknowledge like it's just a video game. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's nice that I, you know, that I said Metal Gear, I would love to own a copy of Metal Gear Solid, The Twin Snakes, it's like, but it's just, at the end of the day, it's a video game. Yeah. We all have those things, man. Yeah. In uh, which case, what would you say then is the the prize of your physical media collection? I guess that's a question you could ask of those watching at home. It's got to be Mega Man X2. Um, that, it's rare. It's incredibly good. I was ex- so excited to get it on Christmas. Like, my grandmother got it for me. I knew she got it mm-hmm. for me. I snooped like an asshole. <laughs> I played you, it, but you, you sn- I snooped. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but I did because I was so excited. And one of the things, like, I've kept the same car- cartridge. I never traded that one, even though I prefer the original Mega Man X. I yes. have more memories with it. I had I had to struggle through beating it and everything. But with Mega Man X2, I, like, looked everything up online. I spoiled it for myself. And only yeah. in recent years, I've done, like, challenge runs with no armor, no heart tanks, no sub tanks and stuff like that where it sort of reawakened like my appreciation for it to uh, for the design of the thing where it's you know where i was unsatisfied the first time i beat it because i was like oh well this is just too easy no i just spoiled it for myself 
and I learned an important lesson through uh, through that. So it taught you a lesson. It did. It did. Absolutely. Don't spoil things for yourself. There, it, when you know that working through it is, uh, and this is why I enjoy tra- challenge challenging games still today, is that there is a satisfaction inherent in completing a challenge and knowing that you made it you know i have similar feelings every time i complete a draft of a book or a piece Mm -hmm. of art you know it was a huge formative experience for me to learn that lesson that wasn't me fighting by the way it was my stomach i've got stomach cramp it won't show up on the mic but if it did i was like what an awful stomach cramp just then that was awful (laughs) but yeah uh, I'll start. Uh, stop rambling about that, and uh, just uh, we'll close out with thank you, Carl, so I, much. I was, just, I was gonna say I've got one. Just I thought this is a fun story because I've, I've just noticed out the corner of my eye. I meant because it's just, the fact that I own this is so weird. Okay. <laughs> oh, so I thought I'd just mention this. Like, so I used to be a bartender. Like, I love being a bartender, and um, I love mixing drinks, all that good stuff. I've got a drinks cart just over there for making cocktails and stuff, and. One of the things I bought just on a whim was I got this. This is show you this is Booth's Handbook of Cocktails and Mixed Drinks by John Doxett, who's apparently a famous mixologist and expert on drinks. I I had no idea who this guy was, but I picked this up on eBay for like fifty pence from like a okay. a job lot. And the first thing I did is I open it, and it just says inside for Betty with all the sincere good wishes from John. Huh. And it was sat, and it says here, John Doxer, Guildford, twenty fifth of the tenth, nineteen seventy eight. So for fifty pence, I got a signed copy of this book. And I'm guessing nobody else owns a signed copy of this book that I bought for fifty pence. Yeah, at least and that's like not I think that's that a story form. about why <laughs> I just bought it. Like oh, I want to learn to mix some drinks. So I'll have a get one a, a, an old book on it. Get a, an old maybe some old cocktails in there I can like use on the bar. Get a few tips and just ended up with a signed copy of something from a guy I've never met, owned by someone who's presumably long dead. Wow! Because it was like bought for like a house sale, and that's the story I'd like to like why physical media can have a story to it. Of, mm-hmm. This didn't mean anything to me until I got it, and now it has a story. It has pride of place in my house and. It's a conversation starter and can be used as like you know an anecdote from now until when I just forget that I have it. I think that just speaks to the value that physical media can have. Something you don't care about can you can end up caring about it because of the story that will be um, attached to it. I fucking love that, man. <laughs> I fucking love that. Just, uh, that's it. I just ended up just two Betty's. Like who's Betty? I do my mine now. I, I've got a couple Michael Crichton books I picked up uh, secondhand that have some of that in it like there's like notes in the margins and stuff like that it's it's fun i've got a copy of dune that uh i still haven't read because my nephew when he was four years old just scribbled all over the intro pages yes the stuff like that's thing it adds value and like to someone else it might not be worth like someone else might say like you know it's dog-eared it's probably it's been written in I'd hope yeah. it being written in by the original, but there's no proof it was the original author, but I don't know why it wouldn't be the original author. I looked him up. I think the guy died like 20 years ago. Damn. Yeah. What is it? I, I own that now. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I've done for a few of my fans is like when they reach out for a signed copy, I don't have like this listed on my website or anything. I'm not that fucking organized. But when people mm-hmm. reach out, I'm like, yeah, of course, I'll I'll get, send you a signed copy. But I'll also throw in from time to time, if I have got the time, I'll throw in an inking in the back of the uh, the book to, yeah. as just like a special bonus thing, you know? Yeah, I do something similar because I have like business cards printed off. It doesn't happen often. But when people bump into me, I'll, just, like, I'll give them a business card and I signed like random things for fans when they've come up to me in the street, like I've signed way, way, way too many like Yu-Gi-Oh cards for people. But then like, you know, <laughs> that person then has a Yu-Gi-Oh card signed by a YouTuber. And people might think, well, that has no value to someone who doesn't give a shit about me. But to that person, that yeah. is now like, you know, a treasured item. Like, and it's wholly unique to them. And that, again, the value of physical media is like a thing you can hold in your hands that has a story to it. It's hard to have like a story of like, oh, where did you get... Um, that copy of Baldur's Gate 3, I pressed download on the PlayStation Store. 
and now it's on my thing. I've got an attachment to the game, but I have no attachment to the game. Right. You might have an attachment to like the console and how you got it, but like everything on it. No, I bought not... I bought it on Amazon. It turned off. Right. And that's another thing. Like physical media make makes for great gifts during the holidays for birthdays and things like yep. that. Like I'm happy that there are still Nintendo Switch games, you know, that are physical, that are cartridges yep. and whatnot. Um, because otherwise, you know, oh, check your Steam download page or whatever you know that's <laughs> also, not yeah, as cool <laughs> also you couldn't you can't like trick people by time to lick it R right right uh i told my nephew that actually when i gave him his yep. gifts uh i got him a couple mario games because he's never had a nintendo product in his entire life so he's never mm -hmm. experienced mario he's played well actually he had a 3ds and somehow he managed to break it when he was younger yeah like a Xbox um, uh, One controller here that was bought by an ex-girlfriend of mine. That's unique. It's designed to like Pikachu. That's adorable. No one else has. No one else has one of these. And this even has like you know a, a personalized message from my ex on it that just says yes, because that was a running joke between me and her. So I'm not going to get rid of that because you know I've got an attachment to it. Also, yeah. they cost a lot of money. <laughs> they do. Controllers I, are fan fucking of ridiculously like expensive. <laughs> but I'm just a fan of stuff like that. Of like. Even in like this mass-produced thing that there are millions of out there, I own one that is wholly unique, at least to me, and that's yeah. something I think. You know, and you don't I get think, that with digital media. I think this is a good segue to talk about your streaming, your stuff, where people can find you. This yes. is a very, very small channel right now, so. <laughs> but you know, if people want to follow, me, I mentioned this. I will use this controller every. When is this going out? Uh, unsure. <laughs> Okay, so I got to edit it, my, and I got a lot of work ahead of me. My birthday is next week, as of recording this, and I will be like doing my birthday stream as I like to do each and every year. Because the thing you learn as a content creator is your time is not really your own, and as nice as it is to go out for your birthday with friends, it's a really profitable time to stream on your birthday. <laughs> people just always drop subs but if this happens after that, every friday on uh, twitch.tv forward slash carl's wood that's k-a-r-l-s-w-o-o-d um uh, i stream the game metal gear rising revengeance but again just there's a story to it of a friend recommended that i should and i've been doing it for three years now and i i, I love that i, I, I attach I, stories to so many things my wife and i got to sit in on one of your streams because we had a, a free friday night and it was a lot of fun you know? Yeah, it's just... You got to give I'm you a, a little bit of effect. shit as you died. <laughs> you <know? laughs> oh, it's anything that has a story to it. I like when a story can be attached to them, whether it is, you know, an object that I own or uh, just a, a habit or an idiosyncrasy of mine. Yeah. So, you know, the, you as, a, as an author yourself, like, you know, the human experience is just a number of stories all interconnected with more stories. <laughs> You know, and often, you know, dialogue is kind of an artifice. Whatever you can do to try to make the experience of, like, being people in a conversation feel more authentic is, is like, you you need to do that <laughs> as a writer, yeah. you know. If, if you want to get, like, you know... Um, uh allow me to be like you no know, well waxy philosophic up my own ass one more time Go i don't it. save my archive of my streams and even though i've played the same game every single week for the past like three or four years i think each and every one of those streams is in a way unique because you know the way of interacting with a game even one that is like solved at a certain point uh it's always going to be at least a little bit unique there's always be something there that's you know it's there's an effervescent quality to it, which is a thing we didn't really touch upon too much in this podcast of just, while I do agree about having something to just a physical copy of something to store it, the, the effervescent quality of um, the experience sometimes cannot be overstated. Of like, you know, going to see a fireworks show or something like that, or a live performance in a theatre. It's like, while it's nice to have a physical copy of like stuff, so I think there's some things that are better suited to, to be experienced in the moment. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I do see... I see Twitch as like, you know, extension of a live performance. Like, you know, admittedly, yeah, it's like, I'm not going to say I'm like, you know, going to watch like uh, Eddie Van Halen on stage or something like that, but you are witnessing someone do something that's, you know, if you don't witness it in the moment, it's gone forever after that point. Gone forever. That's a favorite phrase of ours whenever we drop food on the floor. Yeah. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a value to that as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I do agree with you. And I thank you so much for coming on for this first episode and for no reviving problem. my previously dead channel for a year. <laughs> no problem. Uh, this has been an awesome conversation with you, Carl. Uh, thank you so much. Oh. And I'll go ahead and transition to the close-up to do the outro. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Story Rant podcast. This is a format that I'm experimenting with. It's going to be off the cuff, kind of like how the original like videos were supposed to be. And there's also going to be solo content uh, that will be uh, video essays, you know, from my brain and from my editor's brain, Phoenix, uh, whenever we get around to doing those. I've got one in the pipeline right now. I've got a lot of cool shit coming your way in the next year and uh yeah just subscribe if you dig this stuff and share it with a friend who likes physical media and i'll see you next time space cowboy <laughs>